Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Before I get started with this episode, this is a little bit of a special episode, so I just want to go over a few notes. Uh, For this episode, I interviewed the highly respected philosophy professor, Peter Boghossian, who teaches at Portland State University. You might have seen him uh, being interviewed by the likes of Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, Michael Shermer, Gad Saad, Brett Weinstein, Sam Harris, and just really um, highly respected people like that. And I reached out to him to see, to to kind of take a shot to see if he would uh, do my show, and he agreed. Um, I did this recording on July 2nd of this year, so it's almost three months ago. And from his request, I waited to release this because his book was just recently um, released, which is... uh, The title is How to Have Impossible Conversations, A Very Practical Guide. And it was written by Peter Boghossian and also former Cylinder Radio guest James Lindsay. I just finished it. I read it in like three days and it's, it's fantastic. And it's really about bridging the gaps that we're seeing in society and how to have impossible conversations, how to have very difficult conversations. And it takes you in a step-by-step process of how to not get into angry yelling matches and really feel understood and have the person that you're conversing with feel understood. It's a fantastic book and I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, So with uh, no further ado, I am going to start the podcast now. And, uh, I think it was a, it was a great conversation. Um, this was prior to my interviews with Mandy Manning and Sydney Chafee and James Lindsay, who are all kind of mentioned a little bit in this podcast, but it was, it was the precursor to all of that. And that's actually got me on the path to being able to interview all of them and talk about social justice, education, and all the things that we've covered in those podcasts. So I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. And, uh, and thank you for, to, uh, Peter for, for doing this. In a world where many people see reality as a circle or a rectangle, the truth is that issues are cylinders. Rather than a two-dimensional understanding, we will flush out the three-dimension complexities through nuanced conversation and civil, respectable discourse to highlight all perspectives on controversial issues. I'm your host, William Roosh, a high school teacher who's trying to transform education as we know it. Welcome to the Anti-Echo Chamber. This is Cylinder Radio. Hello and welcome to Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, and I'm very excited for today. Uh, I managed to land Peter Bogosian, and uh, and we're going to have a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. And before we get uh, into anything else, uh, he does have a story that he would like to tell us uh, about his mentor, Frank Wesley. So, uh, Peter, this is a great way to get into what we're talking about. So thank you for being here, and uh, let's go. Thanks, Will. I appreciate it. My, my mentor was, he died at 97. His name is Frank Wesley. He was a professor of psychology at Portland State University. He was interned in Buchenwald by the Nazis. And then he, his, his German name, he's a German Jew, was um, Franz Wolfson. But he changed it because when he went back, if they ever found out that he was German, he worked as a translator, they would really have tortured him rather exquisitely. So he was a professor of psychology and he told me a remarkable story. I've never told anybody publicly, but I think it's um, very instructive. So Frank was a behaviorist and he looked at people's behavior in terms of operant conditioning and stimulus and response and changing behavior that way. And he told me a story and I think it was in Seattle. And do you know what a, Am I too old? Do you know what a VCR is? I do. Yeah. 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 Well, they had those like little tapes, you know? Mm-hmm. So maybe your, your students are too young to know what that is, but it's just like a little rectangle and you used to put them in this machine. And it, do you think people will know? I mean, am I dating myself? I mean, I don't know what people know. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I hope so, but I don't know. So he had this, he had this, uh, he told me the story and this, this, was on a a VCR at that time there was no digital technology so there was a guy who kept punching himself in the head like this and they tried everything 
and no, nothing, nothing would work on this guy. So they eventually they they attached electrodes to his arms, and whenever he would bring his hands up like this, or, or just I'm going to get up here, he'd start to bring his hands up to punch himself in the head. They would zap him. Right. So the. F and again, this is all on, on video. So the first time he brought his hands up, they zapped him. I don't know. I don't know what the, what the, you know, how many watts or what have you. I can't ask Frank because he's dead. But um, the first time, one zap, he stopped. He started to do him again. When he got his hands about here, they zapped him again. Pretty, pretty good zap. And he never zapped himself after, the, he never hit himself in the head after those zaps. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you the story because Frank was teaching introduction to psychology and he had that um, on a, a VCR tape. And those old analog media, they're not like digital media where you just keep replaying them, you know, in perpetuity. You, you, the, they had problems with the tape. They got stuck, etc. So the the uh, tape snapped, and he sent the tape to the audio visual department at Portland State University, which is maybe no surprise at this point. But um, and they cut the point. They cut the audio visual department under um, direct instruction from the ethics board cut the piece of the tape to show when the guy got zapped for ethical reasons but they left on the vcr the you could see where they had the electrodes so they thought it was unethical to show this this i don't know what the word mentally handicapped i don't know what word one would want to use for the condition i'm not a psychologist but mm -hmm. they thought it was unethical to show this but the consequence of that and the reason i'm telling you the story is that then that data point is re removed from the body of human knowledge so forget about the fact that it becomes more difficult if at all to help people who suffer from these unusual debilitating self you know, conditions of self-infliction we that piece of information gets removed from the timeline so then people they don't learn about that they look they learn about other more humane ways to treat individuals who suffer from these conditions and that's one of the ways that knowledge gets replicated, right? It gets replicated. It's going to sound very postmodern, but I don't mean it to be. But it gets replicated according to the dominant moral orthodoxy. And I think that's extremely important for this conversation. Hmm. <clears throat> Not the full picture. Like they, yeah. they took what was convenient, what, what fits into a nice box, what sounds good, and not necessarily what is, what is truth. Yeah, and what happens is then when, when we're asked someone, well, how do you know that's a way to treat this psychiatric disorder? How do you know? Well, the question of how do you know, that's Socrates' question. That's an ancient question. And how we know things now is compromised. It's in jeopardy. And it's in jeopardy by, to be blunt, moral tyrants. It's in jeopardy by people who are so myopic that they think that they've stumbled upon a, time, a timeless eternal truths and the same people happen to be inhabiting well they're inhabiting everywhere they're, this is a, an age-old phenomenon but it's particularly nasty now because there's a it's coupled with a, a problem with discourse and questioning and looking at language as a, a power structure that's another conversation but my point to you in this the, i think the deliverable for this is that how we know what we know and how people are taught. So think about the kids in that class. So the kids in that class at that time were, I don't know, let's say they're 18 to 21. Those kids go through that whole educational period, some of whom become teachers like you, and they never hear any of this stuff. They never hear that. Now that's just one piece, but there are other pieces like, you know, the validity of the IQ, of the IQ test, for example. Um, so we're basically teaching kids in 
colleges and particularly in colleges of education who then get out and become teachers who replicate the dominant moral orthodoxy. In this, in this case, they, rep they replicate the tenets of intersectionality, critical race theory, et cetera, and they then go on to institutionalize that in K-12 education. It's a tremendous problem. And they do that under the guise of thinking they're better, better people as a result. They're not better people. They just don't have... In, in the Theotetus, Plato says, people don't knowingly do bad things. They only act a certain way because they don't have all the information. They just don't have, it's like the, the thing that when the, the guy smack himself in the head, they don't have that piece of information so that then they teach people accordingly. Yeah, it's interesting. When I was preparing for this, uh, this conversation, I asked people within education that I don't work with, but I respect and at different schools around the country and stuff. And a lot of them were like, what type of problem are you talking about? No, I don't think there's a problem with that. No, yeah, we talk about privilege because you should, and that's important. Right. Like, oh, like, like there's, there's no even, there's no analysis. I'm not against talking about privilege. Nor am I. Uh, yeah, about like, talk about gender, talk about race. These are really important things to talk about, but there's no, yeah, critical thought of going into, like pushing back on why is this just the dominant narrative of how to do it? Right. There's like almost like one, a one-way street on how to cover these topics. Yeah, and the important thing is we need to talk about gender. We need to talk about race. Um, I'm still, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, actually I am a gender studies scholar, but I'm not an actual, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not up on, you know, like for example, my, my son's friends who have known these kids for, for their whole lives, they're <clears throat> wonderful kids. Or my buddy of mine, a buddy of ours, adopted 12 kids from China. Yeah. Wow, all, that's a all, chaotic household. Yeah it, yeah, it was, but because they're all growing up and going to college, and all of them have disabilities. They're just the most amazing kids. It's kind of a uh, testament to a Lord of the Flies uh, <laughs> living situation because they're all wo truly wonderful, amazing kids. But anyway, they were telling me last night that one of these kids is in love with someone who self identifies as a they. Okay. And um, I. I had asked them about if like that's a thing now, like, like I understand, like, is it, is it a, is it a category of sexual expression to be attracted to theys in the same way that it's a category of sexual expression for a guy to be a guy. And even I've been told recently by my kids that those, those binaries, there's no like gay or bi or stuff. There's just, it's not even gender fluid. Of course, I have to preface this by saying I live in Portland, and so it's probably a little more extreme than, than, than most, but they have a different way to look at it. And I think that the way that they look at it is worthy of study. It's worthy of sociological study. It's certainly worthy of anthropological study. But the way to look at that and those phenomenon is to not have an agenda beforehand. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing people come into this with a moral agenda and sacrifice the rigors of scholarship for that. And that gets back to the story as well, because they, well, people will start with something that they think everybody ought to know or ought not to know. And then they'll conduct their research agendas and they'll teach people with all due respect, like you and everybody else who goes through the system, how they should teach their pedagogy, what they should teach. Yeah. My very first podcast, um, I've done a podcast with two transgendered individuals, one trans man, one trans woman. They had very different points of view too, which is actually really great. But the first podcast I did with Danny is he was quoting statistics. He said, you know, 27% um, of Americans are gender non-binary and or gender non-conforming and i was like 27 percent. and then he said yeah well that's according to the williams institute at ucla which i wasn't familiar with but then i googled it and it's an lgbt think tank through ucla oh. so in having these you know you have these ideas you're going to find the science that you can latch on to and i think that when you said that this has always been around but it's different today i think part of that is we just have access to every library imaginable. So you can find a study that will support anything, absolutely anything you can find. We have the internet, so you don't even need to become a college professor to get a voice. You just need a Twitter account. So anyone can start a podcast or a Twitter account or a, or a Facebook page or whatever it is. And anyone can get the data that they want to get. And it just becomes a lot more 
uh, all over the place, a lot more scattered when it comes to the information that we're getting. Yeah, and it's not only that people can find a study, which is certainly true, but people will make up studies that have, so they've taken an agenda and then they're going to research what they already want to conclude, but that's not research. That's concluding what you already want to conclude and then putting it. It's like if you had some moral impulse and I have some moral impulse and my neighbor has some moral impulse and we get together and like, oh, shit, we have this. Oh, I shouldn't have sworn. No, you can. You can. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, You can edit that out. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, we're going to we're going to start a journal. We're going to start a something. So we start a journal. And I discharge my moral impulses in this journal. So I write, write a piece about whatever I want to write a piece about. And then that becomes knowledge. Brett Weinstein's idea is he calls it idea laundering, mm-hmm. where everybody has these moral impulses. You make a journal and you comes out the other side as knowledge. That's an extremely important component. But in your case for high schools is what happens is that those articles and those journals are taught to um, – well, they're taught to, to teachers in the pre-service teacher education program and people who want to be teachers. So the problem is that people think that they're formulating their beliefs on the basis of knowledge and they teach the kids that, but it's just not true. It's, it's, it's totally false. And they've cr- created this system <coughs> where anybody who challenges what they do, they brand them or smear them as a bigot, a racist, a sexist, a homophobe. It's a huge problem because it's a, it acts as a sheath or a protective mechanism from criticism. Yeah, actually, you mentioned uh, Brett Weinstein. Uh, I heard Heather Hying, his wife, one time say, which is probably a very basic scientific idea, but it seems to be lost, that when you have a hypothesis, you should try to prove it wrong, not try to prove it right. And it's yeah. such a basic idea, but it's so lacking. And especially in these areas, I think it's justified because it has this moral component. It's not like trying to figure out physics where there's no morality. There's a deep morality, at least in their minds about this, that I have to make this true because this is what will create good things in society. Yeah. And Popper brought this called falsification. You want to falsify your theories, not try to prove them true. That's what creationists do. And there's a very religious component to this. You know, Michael Shermer from the Skeptic Society is mm-hmm. one of the reasons you should believe something is you believe it because generations of smart people have tried to falsify it. In other words, they've tried to show, show it to be false, not because a couple of whack jobs or a bunch of nutcases have proven the idea to be true. Anybody can prove the idea to be true. You just twist the reasoning and you twist the data and you select, you cherry pick what information. I mean, that's, that's a trivial thing, but it's, That's how we get to knowledge. We get to knowledge by ruling out things we know are false. That's one way. Yeah, I actually, I've had the conversation with um, other teachers about, you know, this is a a conversation kind of in in your world, this like IDW world and stuff, but like the, uh, the, what's more important, ending racism or finding truth? or your agenda or truth. And, but when I bring up racism, like I've had several teachers be like, well, ending racism. Like, yeah, well, oh. here, here's the, in the how to have impossible conversations, the question that I think, I think it's in that book. I think we wrote that, but uh, it's, let's, this is a litmus test. Let's say you, this is a hy- hypothetical you can give someone. Let's say I give you a wand and you can cure only one of two plagues on society. You can forever cure anthropogenic global warming. So there's no more global warming or you can cure racism. What do you do? Anybody who says that they'll cure racism is totally, their brain has been prestatized by some racist, crazy intersectional software. Anyone who sincerely looks at the evidence, we'll fix racism, you know, Pinker, the better angels of our nature, things are getting better, et cetera, et cetera. Matt Ridley has some stuff on that. But uh, anybody who says racism when you're faced with a literal species threatening of that right now in Europe, it's baking um, and the polar ice caps are melting, et cetera. So it really is funny that some ideas have been uh, they're They're far more um, insidious and gain traction. Of course we should end racism, but anyone who says that has a failure to, to hierarchically prioritize uh, moral values. Saving the species would be the top value. Um, I I do want to talk a little bit about like just teachers in general, but just before we lose some listeners, like, because I think that this can come off as, Oh, here's two white guys talking about 
race and how it's not a big deal. How do you, cause you're so deep in this world, Peter, like how do you, do you address those kinds of things? Like this is dog whistling for racists and all that kind of stuff. Like I just, I, I don't know. I try and use logical logical arguments. I try to show data and, and, you know, Pew data and police reports or blah, 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 blah. And there are horrible stories. It's How totally, do you deal with there's, that? There's no point in showing data because people don't formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence. So what good is data going to do? That's, a, I think that's a thing I see all, over and over again. Like people will put out some crazy data or, or some, some factual information. Oh, look, Trump lied. Here's just a, well, he doesn't give a shit that he lied. I mean, what what do you so what do you think you're doing by showing a Trump supporter, not all Trump supporters, but if you were to show Donald Trump, you know, like a picture of all these rallies have been attended by tens of thousands of people and you show him the visual evidence of like, there's not even a thousand people there. Yeah. So the data, if data changed people's minds, then nobody would believe stuff like creationism, like Ken Ham wouldn't believe in the Bill Nye debate, like he wouldn't. So any any. You have to ask, you have to take a step back and you have to ask people, you, you formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence. And if the answer to that question is yes, then you, you have to, the next question in that sequence should be, well, then what evidence could I show you that would help you change your mind? Now, there are, there are only a few options somebody can give to that question. They can say, well, there is no evidence. And then you can say, but if there's no evidence, then that's not, then you don't formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence because formulating your beliefs on the basis of evidence means there must be some piece of evidence that comes in that would cause you to change your mind. So, you don't, which is fine if someone doesn't formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence. I mean, it's obviously terrible for them and society and democracy, et cetera, but at least they're being honest about it. Right. And I don't formulate my beliefs on the basis of evidence. I want to hold this because it makes me feel comfortable. Okay. All right. Um, but if, but in the case of race, it's particularly difficult because people will make the claim that there's something intrinsic to the immutable characteristics that you possess that, that prevent you from seeing the truth. And again, these come, this comes right out of certain bodies of literature and you can look at the work the recent, the book that's forthcoming book from Helen Pluckrose, which is phenomenal. Um, so the problem is that everybody, everybody has access to truth based upon their skin color or their sexual orientation or their gender. And then that's a question that there are several, several ways to, to this In fact. I think it's in chapter six of my book. I talk about exactly how to address that. If you want to watch the videos of folks who don't, or not into reading, you should watch Anthony Magna Bosco's videos on YouTube. It's uh, M A G N A B O S C O. He, guides people through a template of challenging and questioning uh, beliefs that they have. But, but I want to, I'm talking a lot, but I want to get back to your question. So if somebody were to say to you, so what are they saying to you? You can't know the experience of like what it is to be a black man pulled over by the police because you're a white man. Something along those lines, or just, you know, how can you say that racism doesn't exist because you don't experience it? So, of course, you wouldn't see it. Things along those lines. Yeah, I've, I've never said that racism doesn't exist. So, but I take the point of the question. So, um, let's say that that's the case that, um, you know, use my example, black men are pulled over more frequently or what have you. Well, that's exactly why you need science. Well, we need science because it separates us from our perceptions, right? It separates people from the, the delusions that they happen to harbor, and we can point to the evidence. The problem is that if someone doesn't believe in evidence, if someone doesn't, either they don't understand the value of evidence, and that's Sam Harris's question. If someone doesn't, someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence can you give them to help them value evidence? Well, there is no evidence right. because they don't value evidence. But that's exactly why we need scientific method in the scientific process, because we can point to data, we can point to sources of data and say, ha ha, look, here's these people were shot, these guys were black, they were shot running in a way, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but that's more of a, my point is to you that that's more of a reason to have comprehensive information, like the, the, the thing I told you at the beginning of the podcast, the story. That's more of a reason to use science to figure out what the truth of the world is or at the very least what's not false and truth wins i mean even if it's an ugly truth truth wins because that's 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 how we function and that's how we rebuild our reality and this gets into um jonathan height has a had, had a, a line in his book and i don't know it exactly but something along the lines of righteous mind 
Yeah, it's something. It was either that I read that in the Coddling the American Mind. I'm not sure, but it was a line that was like, "The human brain is a story processor, not a data processor." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, and I think that gets into what I'm what I see with teachers. Um, if you are a, uh, a school teacher, especially K through eight, though, but I mean more so even than high school. But if you're a teacher. You probably, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but you're probably fairly high on like the agreeableness and openness characteristic traits of those, like the personality traits. Like you're generally a caring person. I mean, you know, like there's something to that, to get into taking care of kids that you are a caring person. So the narrative that is being told by a lot of these, these grievance study professors and by a lot of this intersectional like theory stuff is it's under the guise of being kind and helping those less fortunate and stuff like that. So it makes sense that they will be attracted to that. And I think that's why I'm seeing it and they don't necessarily see it because again, they've been told that this is the way to be kind. And so, so teachers, like I looked up like the national teachers of the year, and in 2017, it was on her website. Uh, her name was uh, Sydney Chaffee. I reached out to her, and I hope I to have her on the show. Um, on her website, it's like, I believe social justice has a place in all schools. You know, um, the 2018 was a woman named Mandy Manning, who I'd just been uh, talking to, and I hope, again, can be on the show. But she met Donald Trump and did a silent protest and had all of her badges about, you know, trans rights now and things like that. And I'm all for trans rights. I'm not, but I think there is something going on here where that is where education, not just the universities, which you are (laughs) as familiar with as anybody, but also all the way down through early childhood development with the gender unicorn and all that kind of stuff. And what gender is your child um, going into preschools? I have a friend who just enrolled his kid in a, in a school in Brentwood in like a very wealthy area of Los Angeles. And they asked for like, you know, gender non-binary and stuff like that in a preschool. Okay. Um, so let's yeah. take, uh, you have so a lot there. Yeah. So if you want to be kind to someone, the best way to be kind to someone is to be honest with them. Right. Particularly if you're teaching in a K through 12 environment, being kind to someone means giving them accurate information and presenting that honestly so that they can make better decisions and live a better life. It c- kindness isn't trying to protect somebody from certain data points that it's like that South park episode. You know, you, you can only protect someone if you try to protect people from, from certain aspects of reality, sooner or later, those aspects are going to come back and bite them. So I don't know what good people think that they're, they're doing by not having an honest conversation with someone because you're certainly not doing them a justice. I don't think you can be from, you know, in the Republic, Plato talks about this, and then John Rawls, the talks about I don't think you can be both kind. I don't think you can. I think if you're, if you're not honest with somebody, not only is that a form of unkindness ultimately to them, and particularly in terms of their psychology and their education but i think it's a form of injustice and i think if you're if you're acting in an unjust way you're by definition unkind to people i think i i would say that they view it as equity is kindness and this is all a push to try and get some equity yeah well that's the the okay well then this is something that we need to talk about well that's utterly false I, I understand. Do you, do, would you agree that that is perhaps one of the things that's guiding them though, is this push for equity? Have you seen that? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And that's why they don't use the word equality. Mm-hmm. They don't use the word equality because they've changed the meanings of basic words. So equity, you want, you, you want me to tell you what, how they use equity or do you want to, you want to go for it? No, let's go for it. I mean, whatever, wherever you want to take it. I'm curious on your thoughts on just on the idea. So, so equality means treating people equally. Mm-hmm. Equity means treating people um, with regard to previous injustices. So that must mean by definition that you treat some people unequally. Right. So you cannot both treat people equitably, equitably, excuse me, and have, you cannot both treat people equally and have an equitable system. And the moment you start treating people in terms of equity in, as opposed to equality, you've, you're unkind to them. You have to be unkind to somebody. You have to be unjust to somebody. Right. Yet equity is the word that's not only bantered around, but equity is the word that's 
um, been institutionalized. It's originally a, people use that, or at least used to use it when I was growing up in terms of finance. But now it's a moral word that's used to redress systemic injustices. Yeah, and I think that you're when you say like on institutional level, like. I, you are for equity within your family, maybe, or like when we're talking about with equity at all, even with individuals, like if I have a kid in my class who has a certain learning disability, another kid who's, you know, who's like, you know, some super smart intellectual type, like I'm going to treat them differently because I want them. Right. Well, first of all, you don't treat them differently. There are different types of equity. You, You don't treat them differently based upon their ancestors. No, no, no. No, the way that I had a woman on who, who, um, uh, who does little justice leaders. It's like a educational things, teaching social justice to young kids. Oh my God. She, the way she explained horrific. Uh, the way she explained, um, the podcast, it was maybe like, yeah, it was maybe like two months ago. We had a great conversation, but the way that she uh, explained equity was she's like, you have two kids. What if one of your kids needs glasses and the other one doesn't, you don't get them both glasses. Of course not. So the way that, again, she was a such, such a kind uh, woman, this um, Shelby was her name, and she really sees this as this is the same way that the, the institutions would work. Some kids need glasses, some kids don't. Is That then translates into what you're talking about, which is some sort of injustice going back generations is kind of like glasses, which I disagree. I don't think it's like glasses, but I think they see it, many of these people see it as the same thing as glasses or dyslexia. Okay, so at this point, we need to go from low def to high def. Okay, so 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 you have different types of equity, and I want to talk about the glasses thing. So you wouldn't treat, I would hope you wouldn't treat a student differently on the basis of their race, right? No, try not, yeah, try not to, yeah, no. I mean, I, I would hope you wouldn't. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm of Armenian descent, and my ancestors were all killed in a, a, gen- a genocide by the Turks. Would you treat my kids differently based upon that? No, I mean, well, here's where, here's where it might, if I'm talking, if, if I'm doing a lesson on Turkey, I yeah. might be heightened in my awareness of how I speak about things because of that. See, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should speak about whatever the best known facts are from the best known or not even the best known historians, but from the, the, uh, the, so, so you gotta be careful when you talk about history, but wh- whatever we know to the best of our abilities. Sorry, my son. No, it's okay. So, yeah, maybe... I think it's a mistake to say, ooh, he's Armenian. Maybe we should talk about the genocide in a different way. Yeah, because I've had, you know, situations like that where I talk about something and and it has to do with a kid. Could be something even very specific about, like, abuse or something. And I'm, like, careful about the way I say it. But part of that also is if I say something that would get you upset or offend you or your kid, then I would hope that they would be able to come up and say like, Hey, you said this kind of upset me and me be able to go, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, and be able to have that dialogue. I think if you're able to have that open dialogue, then I would be less inclined to alter my speech. But because people don't do that, they just retire. They go to the principal and they complain over there. They, we don't have that dialogue. That's the problem. That's for sure. The problem though is it's not clear to me why it's bad that someone's upset. I mean, I understand why it's upset. If you said, shut up, you little shit, sit down and put your head in the floor or something. But if, if you're talking about an idea and engaging an idea, if, if someone in your class is Armenian and they're upset by the, the Armenian genocide, well, you know, you just got to get over that. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why we should tailor our, uh, content based upon people's identity characteristics. That seems utterly insane to me. That, that, that's a form of not only unkindness, that's a form of injustice. I guess it's an, it's a temperament thing. Like, again, I'm a school teacher, so I, I feel bad hurting people's feelings, especially students. Like I feel bad hurting students. Hurting their feelings on the basis of what? Um, knowledge that you give them? No, probably the, the method of delivery. Like, like there's a way you can say something and you say it with kindness and you say it with a little bit of, a little bit of like emotion behind it is different than just saying it like it's a black and white thing. If that makes sense. That's, I think I'm just, that's what I, I think. What I would, if, so what if, if, if it's the method of delivery? So what if you, you started yelling, you know, screaming at them 
speed of light 9.8 meters per second squared or you know yeah. something falls in a, in a vacuum or speed of light you know what if you started screaming with the method of delivery would so i i don't know i i i I question, I question you on that. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I appreciate it. I, I think I just, kids, when you're like, kids are just, they're emo, and so are adults now, but very emotionally fragile. And I wonder if, if I don't cater to that in some way that they will shut down, turn off, and I can't reach them with my ideas, which I believe to be good ideas and, and, and the, okay. the big if, picture. Yeah. If they shut off, Shutting off, I would argue, is a problem with the system. And it's, and again, the way to, and then the reason for that is that they've either been told that or they've been told they should offend, be offended or we've, we've inculcated a sense of um, fragility in them or. Well, they, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. And so, but the, the way to deal with that is not to capitulate to people who are easily offended the way to deal with that is to just say look this is this is what the evidence is and you can dislike it all you want you can dislike me all you want but that's not going to change the evidence yeah i i guess what i the way i i talk i have kids who are very sensitive in my classes and part of what i do there's a reason why kids who are very extreme left like what i'm doing listen to my podcast you know follow my stuff and the kids who are super red maga wearing hats like kids also because uh, i kind of cater to them to reach out my hand go over to their side a little bit to bring them over and they become less sensitive they become less fragile but i ease into it kind of like an old man getting into a bath you know, like it's listen will yeah well particularly kids they want to know what's true mm -hmm. they don't want to be bullshitted nobody wants to be bullshitted and i don't know the woman you had on the little diversity leaders or whatever but that that's lying to people i don't care what she tells you about glasses or whatever she is that is based upon and and we could really talk about the literature the body of literature where that comes from you know white, robin d'angelo's white fragility um miranda fricker we, we could talk about that we've cited those those works in our papers uh the the problem is that that woman is an ideologue and i can tell you almost for sure without even having met her or listened to her here's the question that if you have her on again you can ask her yourself is or any anyone who subscribes to this stuff what evidence could i provide you with that would show that the worldview you're teaching this, these kids is inaccurate uh, yeah. i would love to see what that evidence is my guess is she'll say there is no evidence or this is just a fact it's a worldview well then it's it's not based upon evidence it's just not that there's just no, no evidence for it. You know, the whole white fragility thing, James Lindsay tweeted out, it's good. You can take the white fragility and you can substitute Nazi in there and it works just as well. You can substitute literally anything in that and it works just as well. And you're, it's a Kafka trap. Your denial of the fact that you're a racist does not mean that you're a racist. That's not further evidence that you're a racist. I mean, you're, my denial that I'm a cockroach is not further evidence that I'm a cockroach or a cup of coffee or, or, a, or, or, or a candle or a dog. Um, but I think that the way to deal with that in a K through 12 environment is to just tell people the truth. But you have to be willing to tough it out from parents who will be outraged, from administrators, administrators who will be outraged. And, you know, your job is not to, to cower. Your job is not to tell people what they want to hear. Your job is to be honest with people. And if they can't like it, then if they don't like it and, and, and you cower to people, then they're never going to get anybody in the whole system who's willing to tell them the truth. So there's a legitimation crisis in education and there's a crisis with honesty. We're just not being honest with people. Yeah. And they, you know, it's become such a major part because they've heard some stories and become a major thing. There's this, uh, psychological, you know, thing like idea called the backfire effect where yeah, I wrote about it. You know. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're, you're aware, but for the, those listening, it's essentially this idea that when you are given new data that goes against your, your narrative that you don't, you actually dig your heels in more, you go the opposite direction. And I think that there's an element of that going on with this stuff. And it's, it feels like you, you are being attacked, like you're being attacked by a bear in your brain, because especially if part of, if so much of your identity of who you are as a human being is wrapped up in this ideology, then right. attacking that ideology is like attacking you as a human being. That's why you don't present evidence to people when you mm -hmm. 
want to help them think through the beliefs. That's why if you ever, you know, if I would ever speak to that woman, there's just no, you don't believe that stuff. You don't come to those beliefs because you formulate your beliefs in the base of evidence. You come to those beliefs because you don't formulate your beliefs in the base of evidence. So there's no evidence that's going to get you to the point of there's there's no evidence that's going to shape up your epistemology or how you know what you know well it's i it's i'm putting air quotes in um i know my experience it's my truth it's it, that's i think that's where it goes to and yeah, that's, who are you to tell me what my truth is <laughs> that's like a, all okay, right but why don't people use that when they go to the bank why don't people use that when they want to change a $5 bill and tell them that your truth is that it's nine $100 bills? I think you should try that exact same philosophy or try that when you walk across the street. Why don't you walk across mm-hmm. the street in a busy highway and you tell, you tell yourself all you want that your truth is that the cars are going to go right through you. So that's just verbal behavior that's bullshit. And people who say that, they know that that's true. Your truth only applies in terms of subjectivity. Your truth, in tr- you know, you like pepperoni on your pizza. This dude over here likes anchovies. That's your truth. That's fine. But it doesn't work with matters of fact. You, you're, you can't change the temperature at which, which paper burns, 451. Right. It's not, uh, and so in that, starting to so that no, no. idea is the... And that's what we see now. It's a denigration of objectivity and it's the rise of subjectivity. In philosophy, we call that the subjective turn. And that's one of the things that's killing us right now is that people, that's one of the reasons that these folks uh, in general, and there's a line, lines of literature on this, don't value dialogue and discourse. They view it as a form of violence. These people are trying to move, make this, Glasserfield has some stuff on this in teaching and pedagogy. They're trying to move this to to radical subjectivity and narrative such that if somebody has the subject and particularly in this context it's in the it's dealing with race and gender and sexuality issues etc that there's something intrinsically unknowable about those um about those experiences and then the primacy of those experiences should override anybody else's perception of those experiences but that's just not true I mean, let's say that were true. Let's just accept by fiat for this conversation that that were true. How would we, how would we know? What could we do? What, what, what could we act upon as a result? We couldn't do anything because everybody would be caught in a subjective bubble. Right. There'd be no way to adjudicate anything. There'd be no way to navigate a social reality. That's why we have laws. That's why we have you know, precedent and jurisprudence. That, that's why we have systems that we have put in place. But then the response to that is, well, then those systems are inherently patriarchal and oppressive. Okay, well, that's a conversation we can have, but that has nothing to do with how we navigate allegedly subjective norms. Peter, do you believe that the ones who are running these journals that were hoaxed and the, the, the department heads and stuff like that, the people coming up with these theories, that they probably have some bad intentions about what they, they see this, they, they see it. They're kind of like the, you know, maybe the puppet masters, but then a lot of people don't see it. The, a lot of people are following it because they believe it to be kind. Cause I, I think that a lot of people follow these ideas, this intersectional theory and, and, you know, gender studies theories and stuff like that. I think they follow them because they believe it's the kind thing to do. You, you mentioned the kind thing again. Um, yeah. Do you, and that, yeah, I think that's the way they see it, yeah. I keep, I keep thinking about the fact that you brought it up twice, the kind mm-hmm. thing. And mm-hmm. uh, without question, I mean, it's certainly a guiding value in my life. But that's guiding value in my life. It's unclear to me what the role of the educator should be in terms of kindness and if that should be even valued at all. Mm-hmm. Or the role of the educator should be truth teller the role of the educator should be which i think it should be to give people an infrastructure critical thinking infrastructure a way to engage thoughts and a way to understand moral values but it's unclear to me how it what is clear to me is how not doing that is a form of injustice and unkindness and i keep linking uh injustice to to being unkind so i guess the question is what what 
the role of the educator should be what in terms of being kind to students? What if someone is going to fail? I've had people say literally that they'd lose their scholarships if I didn't give them I can't, whatever it is to pass. And I think in one case I'm thinking of as a C minus. She'd lose her scholarship and she would have had nothing. And she's just begging me. Is it a, is it a kindness? Well, let, let's say it was being kind. I'd argue that it's an injustice to her and to the system because you compromise the integrity of the system. And I compromise my own integrity, but bracketing my own integrity, it's not clear to me that, that the role of the educator should be to be kind. Now, some kid comes up to you and they're bleeding, et cetera. Obviously, that, that's different, but I'm talking about the way that you your pedagogy, the way that you talk about knowledge, the subjects that you choose, it's not... Th those things are more murky to me. I, yeah. would, I would think justice should trump kindness. Yeah, I, th I think that you're just you and your your background, your personality. I think you're a very like logical, like fact based. Sci you're a scientist. Like I think there's a lot of that where a lot of people who are sixth grade teachers or fifth grade teachers they probably have a very different temperament and i think that they're they just filter things through their brain a very different way i didn't okay, okay. so if their temperament though is you know is what is their i mean is their temperament oh we need to what is that what would that temperament be i think it's a mu much more of like a like a parental motherly caring empathetic type of person than teaching about the world about facts about you know uh, the helping kids to understand reality so that they can go out into the world and make the most of this life. I think that that that's the way that I view it. But again, I, I have a different personality than a lot of teachers. So I, if their, if their emphasis is on playing a parental role and a fatherly role, mm -hmm. if you're a guy or what have you. So then that would mean what the, that they want to, it would still mean that they want to protect kids, which would mean that they still should be honest with them and forthright in their speech about what they teach them. Protecting yeah. people from, you could protect somebody from the fact that, you know, you walk into a, if you don't wash your hands, you I mean, you could protect people from all kinds of stuff or try to, but that's just going to come back and bite them at the end of the day. So I'd, I would argue if they're, it, it's just a question of values and to be very blunt with you, they're valuing the wrong things. There's just no way to say it that some people value the wrong things. Yeah. And a lot of it's short term versus long term, too, is you might make the kid feel better right now, but not down the road. Um, I was I, I did a long rant on um, the, a woman who, uh, who did a lecture at St. Olaf's College, and she was basically talking about how Western society just needs to be taken down, blah, blah, blah. And it was talking about like fat shaming and and things like that. And basically her I, oh, everything was just aligned with do what makes you feel good. And this is getting a little bit off of off topic, but it's, I think it, it's aligned also where, you know, if my kid wants to eat cookies for dinner, no, it will feel good now, but down the road it won't. And the same thing goes for this hurts my feelings. What you're saying hurts me based on this or that or that is you can make them feel good right now by saying you're right. You are, you've been wrong for all these reasons, but down the road, it's going to serve them poorly and i think we're gonna see this we're just in this weird time right now but thanks to people like yourself it'll start to get more and more exposed and then in time we're gonna look back at this time and go oh yeah we're just kicking the can down the road and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse i guess even even more serious than that is that you fail your role as an educator and you fail your your kids by doing them an injustice I mean, who, yeah. who, are you, who are you, not you, but who are these people who think they can just dole out injustices that are masquerading as, as uh, equity or whatever fancy words they want to use? It's just not. And this person who wants to deconstruct Western civilization, you should really listen to Helen Pluckrose's talk at the Ramsey Center. It's one of the best. Mike Nine in his video, his video um, you should check out his uh, YouTube channel, N-A-Y-N-A. -A. Mm -hmm. He has a piece about, uh, he's puts uh, Helen Pluckrose's talk. It's a wonderful talk. I'm constantly marvel at people who want to destroy Western civilization, the very civilization that gave us freedoms, modernity, gay rights, um, the very, you know, the, it, it, it's, it's a very bizarre notion that the core tenets of Western liberalism are somehow, 
um, uh, either rooted or fixed in white people, or which is always a claim. But I want to get back to this the whole education thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a an injustice to not provide like what they did when they took the VCR thing tape out. It is an injustice to take that out of the historical record. You're doing people an injustice. You can look at that not only in that context, but in virtually any other context in which you attempt to shield people from, especially with the internet, that stuff's going to just become available to people anyway. And then they'll think, well, why didn't I learn this? And then that's when you get the real backlash. In the Republic, right. Plato talks about whether or not, you know, basically lying to people and telling them they have different bloods in them, silver, and, you know, the leaders have gold, et cetera, et cetera. I just, I'm not a fan of lying to people particularly students. They're in the class to get an education and to go to you as somebody who can sift through the garbage and the nonsense out there on, and on the online sites. They're going to, to, to you to be someone who has a sense of integrity, not to be an ideologue. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to say to teachers out there listening is to piggyback off of what you said is you have to start figuring this stuff out for yourself. So if you are not familiar with what, what this, what you and I are talking about, Peter, like go out and you need to challenge these theories. Just like I mentioned what, uh, what Heather Hying said is, you know, if you start challenging intersectional theory, start challenging these ideas, the, the, the common narratives of privilege. Um, and then once you start to see this, then you share that process. I went through this process. I, I was deep into that world five years ago. And then you were, you were taught it, I would imagine in the, your college of education. Yeah. College of education, people in my life, like the family that I came from, like all this stuff, that was just like the common narrative. And then thanks to, I think it was probably like Joe Rogan's podcast that opened me up to a whole bunch of different people, including yourself. And then like, it just like became this like rip avalanche effect of, Oh my God, my, what I believed was reality is not reality. Right. It's, it, there's no it's evidence. Startling. It's, it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's a shaking thing to go through. Right. And, and it is, and that's the one commonality that every human being has had throughout all of history. We have reality tunnels. And in these reality tunnels, we think that, geez, all these things are true. These things in our, in our intellectual and moral landscapes, we think that they're true, but it's just an ideology and people are, are beholden to intersectional ideology, which is a particularly parasitic one because it latches on to traditional existing value structures. We've seen that in the left, you know, they've latched on to the old school Noam Chomsky leftism. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would, I would argue that just as anything you need to, you need to show people, you need to look, how do people know this? And then you look and they say, well, we, we know this. This is why this is insidious and why this is particularly difficult to pull people out of. We know this because it's in the peer-reviewed literature. But we've already talked about the fact that the peer-reviewed literature itself has been idea laundered and it's been a bunch of ideologues getting together and coming up with conclusions they already agree with. So the key then is to try to figure out, could you, I mean, you know, I teach ethics at a university here, could you imagine going to the class with your conclusions already in hand and then testing people on those? That's exactly what we do with intersectionality and equity and changing the definition of racism to, you know, power plus privilege, power, you know, it's exactly what we do uh, in other domains and other teaching arenas, you know, and, and now we're building a whole architecture a university architecture based upon things that are just silly, dangerous, dangerous silliness. Um, for people who aren't aware, I don't want to go through it. You've done a ton of interviews and you've, you're all over the place about like the hoax papers and stuff like that. But what, what you're just referencing is the, you, like uh, I mentioned about the first podcast that, that I did on this show, you know, there is literature out there that is peer reviewed, that is in scientific journals, that is, nonsense that is not credible science but that is something that people are grabbing onto it's very hard then for when you're when i'm telling teachers to go out there and like test these ideas it's very hard because even the science and that's how we base what we know and what we don't is what is done in these universities in 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 these labs and by by these brilliant professors like this is how we determine what is real and what is not and that has been corrupted and once that has been corrupted it is 
it is gnarly. It is a really, really scary situation. It's um, not being corrupted. It is corrupt. Yeah. It is yeah. corrupt. And they're using methods to justify their own conclusions that you cannot independently look at those methods and arrive at those conclusions. And the problem is, you know, if you do it with a Christian or someone who's religious and you ask them about their, you know, Jesus walking or talking snakes or whatever, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to faith. But with the intersectional crew, at the end of the day, they point to various lines of literature, which they themselves have manufactured. The whole thing is bogus. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's not even a house of cards because at least that there are cards there. Yeah. And so, um, so the, the question, the yeah. question is, so, so what do you, so, so what, what do you do as your, your teacher? If you're a teacher, my advice would be in the same thing. And I went to my, my daughter's school and they have these, so I live in Portland here and they have, how old is she? Uh, she's 13 now. Okay. And, uh, uh, she attends a public public school here in town and they have these food carts. The food carts are a wonderful aspect of Portland. They're not like, you know, when you grew up, they're like these cheesy hot dogs and stuff, but there's mostly immigrants and they have amazing food. They're like Mexican carts and, you know, Indian carts. They're great. But anyway, the, uh, that land got bought out by developers and now they're putting condominiums in there. But the, the area gentrified, but the area's gentrification was responsible for the food carts in the first place. Now further gentrification has been responsible. So for this, and I loved it because it was a great neighborhood place. Everybody could get what they wanted. Nobody was fighting over. I don't want to go here. It was just perfect. But the point is that I went to my daughter's school and they only teach one side of quote unquote gentrification and almost invariably, if not invariably, it's a leftist position. And what we really need to do is we need to start talking about intellectual diversity. And so if you're going to start and the books that she was required to read were all about how bad gentrification was, but there was never an other side of the coin. So we need to start telling people, particularly about areas. Gentrification is a great example. Um, you know, it really does people and enjoy, you are not being kind to people by giving them a book that supports your worldview. Sooner or later, I can guarantee you she is going to run into somebody who does not think that that's a good idea and she will not be armed with the tools. And this is, look, if you're listening to this and you're an educator, here's what I have to say to you. Listen up for real. If you really believe that what you think is true, like you genuinely believe in this case, gentrification is bad. It's terrible. It's terrible. Unless you show people the other side of the argument, you will create students who are utterly incapable of dealing with that. And the best example we have for that has been around for thousands of years. It's in it's uh, Christians who are Christian apologists. Doesn't mean I'm sorry for the faith. It comes from first Peter three fifteen, a defense of the faith, a robust defense um, the apologist, any and every apologist knows exactly the arguments that atheists will use. These people are well honed. They're well trained. They're, I think they're wrong, but they're, they're, they know the arguments in and out in the same way that they know the arguments. You should think about retooling your curriculum and your style to be a more ancient Socratic, or in this sense, even a Christian idea of giving people the tools they need to analyze arguments and giving them the best arguments on the other side. And if you can give people the best arguments on the other side and an infrastructure, a critical thinking infrastructure, then they'll be capable of coming to better conclusions. And if you really are right, if you really are, if it really is the case that gentrification is some overarching moral evil, then you will have taught them well so that they can come to that conclusion on their own. So you don't have to worry about it. You've done your job. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be scary for teachers. If they decide to go down this road, it takes guts because you are going to have conflict first within yourself, which I know that conflict within yourself is very, very hard. And it's very easy to not have that. But then after you do that, then there's going to be conflict with your tribe because I'm guessing your tribe, you're in some echo chamber. So that's going to be cutting off, getting cut off from family. That's going to be getting cut off from friends. It's going to like, it could be losing your job, getting into trouble at your, at your, uh, at your job, which you might be aware of. So this kind of stuff is what is, is what is at risk. It's a very, but it's, 
that's being a rebel. That's being a renegade. That is stuff that like it is? That's is very American. It's being a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. The teacher is, and that's someone who has integrity and that's someone who speaks in a forthright way. And that's someone who places a regard to, for the truth above any political agenda that they have. That's someone who wants to create a leader. That's a real leader. That's someone who wants to educate people. That's educare, the Latin, to lead out of. That's somebody in the seventh book of Plato's Republic who leads people out of the cave. You're not putting, education isn't putting stuff into people. You're not indoctrinating them with stuff. You're giving them a way to think so they can formulate their own opinions. And the only way to do that is through intellectual diversity. The only way to do that is to show people the other side of the argument and the best arguments at that. And if you don't do that, I would argue not only have you damaged your students by being unkind and unjust, you've been unjust towards yourself. That is a great place to end, Peter. That is, that's, that's the Braveheart speech for, for the educators out there. Like this, it's cool to be rebellious in this way. It's cool to seek truth and to seek that at the top. And your students will love it. They will admire it. They will appreciate it. They will appreciate you pushing them to, to challenge ideas and to find truth. And yeah, and I'm going to add one thing. Yeah. Um, your students will absolutely love it but you'll have a minority of students who will loathe you. Yeah. You Parents too. And you're going to get in trouble probably. Go to rate my professors or where they'll go to, they'll fill out your end of course surveys and they'll say what a horrible beast you are. But that's a consequence of truth telling. That's yeah. a consequence of personal integrity that, that, you know, you're not mealy mouth. You're not wishy washy. You say, this is the data. I'm willing to change my mind if something else comes in. But until that, and this is what some smart people who believe, you know, with Trump, I mean, I think Trump's a fucking lunatic, but uh, this is, these are some smart, you can add that word out too. No, no, no. But, you know, <laughs> these are some smart people who, who uh, happen to uh, believe this and this is why they believe it. And it's not because they're racist or inherently evil. I think that these thoughts are not, I always give my own bias as well, but I, I think that these thoughts are not accurate, but this is the best argument. And if you really want to know your own, that's John Stuart Mill's idea that you, to, 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 if you only know your own side of the, the position, you don't even know that. So you really know what it is you believe. You have to know the other side of the, of the arguments and you have to know their, their strength and you have to look at that from the best. But the final thing I want to say is, that whole process assumes a kind of honesty and maturity. And I think many people are not ready to be honest with themselves because they're emotionally mature, among other reasons. So it's really uh, at root is a call to be honest with yourself and your students and a call to, to, you know, we don't use the expression anymore, man up, but if you don't like man up, woman up, person up mm -hmm. and, and just take, take you, cause you'll take shots for being honest with people for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm seeing that just a little bit. Um, I've been doing this for like a year with uh, social media and this podcast and stuff like that. But this, I, I, I'm seeing start the start of something here where people are responding. People are responding like, Oh, this is not what I typically get. So, um, okay. Well, Peter, thank you so much for being, for doing this. I well, time, time, giving someone your time is, is, is some is, uh, one of the most sincere things you can give somebody, you give me, you know, a good chunk of your morning. So I really, I really appreciate that doing that for just a high school teacher who's trying to start this thing grassroots. So I really appreciate I it. I don't know, just a high school teacher, you're a sincere inquirer and you're very deserving of that time. And so I think what you're doing is, I think what you're doing is important. It's a conduit to get to people from what you have. Um, and maybe you could do some modeling and some, some, I think it's a, it's a needed it's you need yeah. it and you seem like the man to do it. So uh, I'm working on it. Thank you, sir. Is there anything else that you want to say? Um, plug whatever. Uh, let's okay. see my book, how to have impossible conversations is, uh, out September 19th, 2000 or September 17th, 2019. And, uh, we're going to be showing a film that we have coming out. Uh, so that's it. Just the, how to have the, impossible conversation to book for the moment so I, I appreciate it beautiful oh and then right. twitter yeah. twitter at peter bogosian okay cool all right thank you sir yeah. all right take care this has been cylinder radio the success of this podcast and the educational revolution that i hope you will be a part of is dependent on those who find value in it 
please take a few moments to review us on iTunes so the show is more easily found. If there was a perspective on today's topic that was not highlighted in this episode, or you have an idea for an episode topic that you want to understand more deeply, please email us at cylinderradio at gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram at Will Roosh, W-I-L-L-R-E-U-S-C-H. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to the next one.